thank you for joining me for this week's object talk. My name is Emma and I'm an engagement officer at the Jewish Museum at London. Now this week's object talk is a special one for two reasons. Firstly, because our volunteer Michael will be leading it. Now Michael has been volunteering at our museum for over five years welcoming visitors to the museum galleries, answering their questions and sharing his knowledge about our collection. So Michael, thank you so much for joining me for this week's talk. Thank you, Anna. Now, this object talk is also special because this week we are marking Remembrance Day and Michael has chosen an object that fits into this theme. Michael has delivered talks on this object at the museum in person and it is one he knows very well. I'm really pleased he's chosen to share this object with everybody watching. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michael, to introduce us to the object and tell us more about it. Thank you. Well, hello. Jewish Museum in London is very privileged to have in its possession two of this country's principal awards for gallantry. Firstly, the Victoria Cross, commonly known by its initials VC, which is the highest award for valour, quotes, in the presence of the enemy and it's given to members of the British Armed, and Com uh, British Armed Forces and Commonwealth Forces. This was awarded to Petty Officer Toma Gould, Tommy Gould of Her Majesty's Submarine Thrasher for action in September 1942. And that's Tommy Gould's Victoria Cross, and you'll see it's a purple ribbon, uh, highly prized, and the museum is very fortunate to have one in its possession. The George Cross in the museum's possession was awarded to Harry Errington, who was a member of the London Auxiliary Fire Service in the war, and in fact, the only member of that service to receive the award, the award in World War II. So this is Harry Errington's set of medals, um, as you can see them in the museum. And from the left, we have Harry's George Cross, the Defence Medal, and then the Queen's Coronation Medal, the Queen's Silver Jubilee Medal, and the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal, because at that time, all Victoria Cross and George Cross holders were invited to join the Queen's celebrations. Harry was born in August 1910 in Poland Street uh, to a family of immigrants from Lublin in Poland, Solomon and Bella, previously named Erangot. Having won a trade scholarship, he initially trained as an engraver, but he didn't get on with the nitric acid he had to use in the process, so he joined the family firm of tailors, Errington and White, first as outworker and later of Savile Row, and he joined as a cutter. Now at this stage in the museum, I usually turn people's attention to the cutting shears we have on the tailor exhibit in the, in the museum. Don't have them here, but imagine a very heavy, long pair of scissors used for cutting cloth. Today, lasers cut cloth, but at the time cutting was a very precise art and Harry eventually became a master cutter. Now when war broke out, he walked into the fire station in Shaftesbury Avenue, which is still there, and volunteered as an auxiliary fireman. Here's a picture of Harry in his uniform um, wearing the George Cross. In, in the photo you saw him wearing a peak cap and, and that's because um, after he joined up he wasn't issued with a helmet for some time. He had a rather large head so he had to wait for one to be made especially for him. Now 1940 the Luftwaffe diverted their attacks away from London to industrial cities and ports to disrupt the war production and overseas supplies, but it was still believed that the public could be bombed or terrorised into, into surrender. Most nights in London had air raids using V1 incendiary flying bombs and V2 high explosive rockets, and Harry had been posted to Soho substation Z to deal with the resultant fires. On the 7th of September 1940, bombs had been falling across southeast London. This became known as Black Saturday, with 430 dead and 1,600 wounded, and Harry was there. On the 8th, he was in Clerkenwell and Shoreditch. On the 15th, he was fighting fires in Great Scotland Yard, and on the 16th, fighting fires in Farringdon. By September the 17th, he was exhausted, and he rested with two other auxiliary firemen in the basement of a three-storey garage used as a private air raid shelter for fire service personnel. This was in Rathbone Place, near the junction with Oxford Street at the Tottenham Court Road end. And there you can see I've got it a slightly enlarged Rathbone Place. I actually walked past it today and it's just past the fire station in Shaftesbury Avenue, which is still there. Um, so that's Rathbone Place. 
just off Oxford Street. So paradoxically, it was near to his fire station and not far from his family home, 200 yards away. In Harry's own words, the basement was dark, damp, but warm. He placed a blanket on the floor of the basement and rolled up his tunic jacket for a pillow. At this stage, let me read the entry in the London Gazette of 8th of August, 1941. Central Chancery of the Orders of Knighthood, St. James's Palace, SW1. The King has been graciously pleased to award the George Cross to Harry Errington, Auxiliary Fireman, London Auxiliary Fire Service. High explosive and incendiary bombs demolished a building. Errington and two other auxiliary firemen were the only occupants of the basement of the building at the time of the explosion. The blast blew Errington across the basement, but although dazed and injured, he made his way to the other two auxiliaries, whom he found to be pinned down, flat on their backs, by debris. At this point, I explained to Americans, it's debris and not debris, but anyway. Um, a fierce fire broke out, and the trapped men were in imminent danger of being burnt to death. The heat of the fire was so intense that Errington had to protect himself with a blanket. After working with his bare hands for some minutes, he managed to release the injured men and drag them from under the wreckage and away from the fire. While he was so engaged, burning debris was falling into the basement and there was considerable danger of a further collapse of the building. He carried one of the men up a narrow stone staircase, partially choked with debris, into the courtyard, made his way through an adjoining building and thence into the street. Despite the appalling conditions, and although burned and injured, Errington returned and brought out the second man. Both Errington's comrades were severely burned, but survived. He showed great bravery and endurance in effecting the rescues at the risk of his own life. Now, to give some added detail to that, in the garage above were fire engines, taxis, cars, and fuel tanks. The direct hit caused those to ignite and erupt and 20 civilians and six firemen were killed instantly. The floors caved in and the building collapsed into the basement where Harry and his two colleagues had been sleeping. The blast blew Harry across the basement and in amongst 40 feet of rubble and when he recovered he found that a fierce fire had broken out. As he ran for an exit he heard screaming and turned to find one of his colleagues, John Hollingshead, pinned down by falling masonry face down with his uniform torn from his back and in imminent danger of being burned to death. Harry put a blanket over his head and shoulders in an attempt at protecting himself. He tore at the scolding masonry, cutting his hands, and with skin peeling from his fingers and palms, he got the man to his feet. Now that's quite significant because Harry was a cutter and the, his hands were his tools of his trade. So, or part of the tools of his trade. So with no thought to what he was doing, he scraped away at the, at, the, at the poor man. Now debris was still falling into the building and there was further danger of collapse. Harry carried his colleague through the debris, up a narrow staircase and into a courtyard, eventually getting him back onto the street. On his way out, he saw his second colleague, a man called John Terry, lying unconscious with a large radiator pinning him down, almost choked with falling debris and with blood pouring from a wound on his head. Harry's hands were hurting, and knowing that permanent damage could, as I say, threaten his livelihood, he returned to the basement. Now, it's an apocryphal story, I don't know if it's true, but um, it's believed that Harry went back against instructions. He was ordered not to go back into the basement, but he did anyway. He heaved the radiator out of the way, and still groggy, in his own words, quotes, virtually frog-marched him, frog him out into Oxford Street. Harry initially then got John Hollingshead to the museum, to the Middlesex Hospital, where they were turned away because they were, quote, walking wounded, but then to the Women's Hospital in Soho Square. En route, another incendiary hit Oxford Street, so there were bombs falling all around him. Harry was eventually moved to the Middlesex Hospital, then out for recovery to a hospital in Aylesbury, where he was discharged after one month. Asked afterwards, Harry just said, quote, you had a job to do and you had to get on with it. I was lucky not to be severely injured in the long term. Now, unfortunately for Harry, the Civil Injuries Act at the time, which applied to the fire service, ruled that firemen injured in war service could only be kept on full pay for 13 weeks. As his burns hadn't healed in that time, he was compulsory, compulsorily discharged. Interestingly, John Terry, the second man, 
served as managing director of the National Film Finance Corporation and was eventually knighted for services to the film industry. Harry carried on working as a master cutter until he retired at the age of 82. His greatest interest was in basketball and he coached the amateur team from Regent Street Polytechnic. He helped organise the basketball competition at the 1948 London Olympics and also served as an umpire in that sport at national and international level. As a young man, he confusedly invited two girls to the same basketball final and decided that, in his words, romance was a chancy affair and he remained unmarried. He was always impeccably dressed, a gentleman and a member of the Worshipful Company of Firemen and sometimes honorary secretary of the VC and GC Association. Harry died in December 2004 at Nightingale House. I went to his funeral and first thing I immediately noticed was the strange sight of four fire engines in the car park. After the service, the route from the prayer house to the graveside was lined by serving firemen because the fire service never forgot Harry Errington. Now my dictionary defines the word hero as a person noted for courageous acts or nobility of character. With no thought for his own safety, Harry twice saved the lives of others. In my humble view, Harry was more than just a hero. Now, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Michael, for such a wonderful, fascinating talk. It's really great to hear of your, your personal connection to this object and all the knowledge that you have about it, and to reflect on the incredible story of Harry Errington. And thank you to everybody for watching, for joining us for this week's talk. Do join us again next week at the same time where our object talk will be on the theme of interfaith. We will see you there.